Welcome everyone to this webinar um, hosted by the 21st Century China Center. We're really happy that you're joining us today. I'm Margaret Roberts. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, the Hali Yodlu Data Science Institute um, at UCSD, and I'm the director of the China Data Lab. But we're really excited that you're joining our discussion today. And before we get started, we want to remind you that this webinar is recorded and will be made available at our website, china.ucsd.edu. I also want to remind you that if you do have a question during this talk, um, the, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So you'll notice there's a chat function, but the Q&A function is the one that you want to submit. If you have a question, I'll be reading the questions that you submit for our speaker during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So today we're really honored and delighted to have Dr. Yang Yang Cheng with us. Um, Dr. Chung is a postdoctoral fellow at the Yale, the Yale Law School Paul Tsai's China Center and is a particle physicist, which is really cool. Um, and at Yale, her research focuses on the ethics and governance of science and US-China relations. Um, and her essays on these and other related topics have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, MIT Technology Review, many other publications. I'm a, I follow her work all the time. Um, it's, and so it's really exciting to have her here. Um, so after Dr. Chung's presentation, I will start the conversation um, in, uh, in a small um, conversation with Dr. Chung, but then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, so welcome, Dr. Chung, and um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Molly, for the overly kind introduction. It's my great honor to share this conversation with you. And uh, in particular, I've learned so much from your scholarship and from many other scholars at UCSD as well. And so um, I titled this talk as A Border in the Endless Frontier. And so we'll start this uh, story with, uh, let's see if it's moving, okay. Uh, with where this title was inspired by. So this starts in, the, uh, in November of 1944 at the end of World War II drew near. And uh, Frank, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt sent his science advisor, Vannevo Bush, four questions about, since now the war is almost, uh, the direction of the war, the outcome is, is quite clear. And all the scientific research that has been produced in the course of, of war, a lot of that was directed under military security. How should that result be shared um, with the world in times of peace? And how should, um, so, so the four questions, the first is about the dissemination of knowledge in times of peace, and then about um, the war of science against disease, and then about, uh, about education and, um, and the government's role in promoting science. And so Vannevar Bush, he is an, he's a, a scientist and engineer. He was formerly the, the dean of the engineering school at MIT, vice president at MIT, and also the founder of the defense giant Raytheon. He, during the war, um, Bush headed the Office of Scientific Research and Development to the wartime science office that oversaw the Manhattan Project. And so Bush, uh, several months later, in July of 1945, sent in this um, report titled Science, the Endless Frontier. And the report emphasized the importance of basic research, which is defined as research with no purpose of practical usage in mind, but it can also yield practical uses. So Bush was really clever in, in, in framing it this way that it appeals to both scientists who do work out of, uh, do out of curiosity driven research, as well as politicians who want to see some kind of practical ends as well as the public. And, and it advocated for strong government support. And here is a context here that here in the, uh, like in the United States, science before the war were uh, not like in, through the 19th century, even to the early 20th century were primarily philanthropically funded. And, and this shifted greatly during the war. And, 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 and partly the Manhattan Project was the first government funded big science project. And after the war, the government, um, primarily the federal government as well as state and local governments became the prime, uh, uh, the main funder for, for, uh, for science, for basic research at universities and laboratories. And that remains the case today. And so uh, the report emphasized the importance of strong government support. And also very notably, Bush also advocated for declassifying in wartime science. And he was, of course, not naive and not certainly not a pacifist. 
but his uh, recommendation was practically minded. And he said if United scientists, United States could um, have this kind of knowledge, scientists from other countries would have it sooner or later. So it made no sense to uh, classify it and, and it, it made more practical sense to share this knowledge so that it would help the advancement of science. And that's what's going to be instrumental to our national security in the US context. And the report was instrumental to the establishment of the National Science Foundation five years later. And I think it was really interesting in the, in the phrasing, the endless frontier, where Bush described um, basic research as, quote, the purest realms of science and talked about the pioneer spirit. And I think like as in uh, historian Greg Randine wrote in his book, The End of the Myth, how the frontier has had such a strong hold in American imagination. However, it also showed a certain blind spot to the histories of settler colonialism. What is a, a pure realm? And, and it seemed like to play science in this context where it had little social political consequences. On the other hand, this cosmopolitan ideal of science is something a lot of scientists do share. And, and, and in a lot of ways, this has driven the uh, international exchange of science through different times of history, even though it may be appropriated for state and geopolitical purposes. So with that, um, the history of scientific exchange between the US and China, as I was saying, I need to cram 150 years of history into this next 20 minutes, um, but it, um, very much like uh, one important start with was the um, Burlingame Treaty of the uh, of 1868, where it um, established the most favored nation status between the US and then the Qing Empire, and as well as allowed students from both countries to, to study at each other's educational institutions. Uh, three years later, the Chinese educational mission was founded that um, that was the first government sponsored uh, overseas education program from uh, from China, folks then overseen by by, uh, by the Qing Empire. And, and there were students who um, uh, uh, young adolescents um, boy, or boys who were sent to, uh, to the sent to the US 120 total over a course of, of 10 years. Uh, that that I went to school and the, the purpose was they would study a uh, science and engineering as well as uh, like for, for military use and and some of them were uh, were, were <laughs> uh, like the US a lot participating in their baseball um, teams at the Philip Exeter Academy and and of course it, when they went back to um, back to uh, Qing went to China their loyal they were questioned by some of the Qing authorities about their loyalty to the to the throne. Um, and then um, after the Boxer Protocol was, uh, was signed in 1901, uh, several years later, the US government decided to return some of the excess of the Boxer indemnity and, uh, to, uh, to China. And, and, the, the, and the US side decided that they would dictate the terms of how the indemnity, the, the returned indemnity would be used. And they believed that it would be used on uh, the best way to use it is for education, because it would improve US-China relations as well as help civilize the uh, backwards Chinese people. And we could see some of these sentiments still resonate through the history that we'll walk through later. And so there were, um, there were uh, through these different kinds of exchange and um, programs of government funded by each other, um, there were uh, a, a small number of Chinese scientists who were educated um, in the US and and many of them returned to China through the nationalist period in the 20s through, um, through the uh, early 40s um, after, um, through the course of the Japanese invasion. And, and they laid a lot of the foundations for establishing the earliest uh, school, uh, universe, uh, schools and scientific departments and educated a lot of students. And um, when now we come to the mid 1940s as when World War II was already over, but the civil war was raging in, in China. And, and, this, uh, and this political context presented a pressing dilemma to the scientists who were, um, uh, to, to the small cohort of uh, overseas Chinese scientists um, in, the, in the US at the time. And um, they were facing racism and, and, and rising on um, um, anti-communist McCarthyism in the US. Um, they were seeing their war-torn homeland that um, that was um, where the communist re uh, revolution was um, the communist victory was was near or, or, or had already happened and but also um, there was a country where uh, they uh, badly needed scientific talent to help it rebuild and then there was also the uh, the defeated nationalist government that retreated to Taiwan and it is interesting at the time that um, some Chi uh, some Chinese scientists 
um, relatively few China, uh, overseas Chinese scientists follow, uh, follow the nationalist government to Taiwan. And I think this is, uh, to my own understanding, would be seen as how they saw their, um, uh, if they chose to go back to China, their allegiance was with, with the country as in its land and its people, but not really with its ruling government, even though they were citizens of the, the, the Republic of China. Um, when they were studying or working overseas, relatively few went to Taiwan. And so the choice was between uh, China under communist rule or the United States. And I think one example was uh, between this pair of young men, um, uh, Chen, Ying, uh, uh, Chen Ying Yang is, was uh, studying at the University of Chicago for his PhD in physics. His best friend since adolescence, Deng Jiaxian, was studying for his PhD at a nearby Purdue University. And um, after graduation, Yang stayed in the US and became one of the first two Nobel laureates. Um, a, um, of Chinese uh, of Chinese ethnicity, and, and Deng Jiaxian went back to China and was the lead scientist on the Chinese nuclear weapons program, and. And Deng went back to China. Uh, Deng Jiaxian went back to China in 1950, and that was um, when when the Korean War uh, bro uh, broke out, and and quickly the U U U.S. government placed this restriction on barring Chinese scientists, uh, scientists and engineers with these technical skills from returning to China. And uh, several years later, in um, in Geneva. In 1955 to 1956, the U.S. And, and Chinese authorities held these ambassadorial level talks, and one of the main issues was about the repatriation of Chinese nationals, who um, and a lot of them are are, are, are scientists in um, in exchange for uh, for some of the uh, prisoners uh, of the Korean War. And this was and this talk was uh, depicted in this cartoon where the Chinese side were <laughs> were represented by these rabbits, and the U.S. side are are the eagles, and. And so this was, and, and from then on, there was several decades of um, when when the two countries were uh, were on, on two sides of um, of an, of not just an, a a national rivalry but an ideological rivalry. And the scientists who were uh, family, friends, dear colleagues were separated by these borders for the next few decades. And until 1971, after Henry Kissinger's um, secret visit, and then. Um, and uh, Chen Yang, the young man we saw earlier, and um, this was already uh, a decade and um, and a half after he won, uh, and he won uh, after he won the Nobel and was one of the most prominent scientists of of, um, of his generation, and he became the first Chinese American scientist to visit uh, to visit China in the summer of 1971, where he met with the highest levels of the Chinese government. He met with, with Zhou Enlai on his first trip, and and he visited uh, regular um, more or less regularly in the next few years. And in 1973, he also met with Mao Zedong. And uh, in 1972, after the Shanghai communique be um, um, with uh, Nixon's visit, and in the Shanghai communique where both governments said that uh, listed science and technology exchange first as, as one of the mutually beneficial exchanges that the two governments um, could engage in. And, and since then, there were uh, scientist delegations from both countries that visited each other. Um, for, um, the, and a lot of these scientist delegations coming from the US, especially in the beginning, were, uh, were, were a lot of them were ethnically Chinese scientists who uh, saw who were separated by these um, by these borders in the beginning, and and were having this opportunity to not just uh, visit uh, visit China and talk with some of their colleagues and understand uh, where each other on scientific work are, but this was also an opportunity for them to meet their families, uh, whom they've not seen for decades, and on um, this. Um, a delegation in 1972 um, that visited uh, that, that visited China. Uh, this was reported on the front page of the People's Daily, and this was led by the Chinese American uh, physicist Ren Zhigong, Chi Hong Ren at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. And, and another context in this was um, how these uh, Chinese, Ameri especially Chinese American scientists, when they visited China in the 1970s. Um, and, and their work uh, and their trips drew um, attention and surveillance from US intelligence. Um, Chen Yang talked about how the FBI would talk to him every time he comes back. And, and, and Ren Zhigong, who led to this delegation, in, uh, this Chinese American scientist delegation to China in 1972, was placed under um, many years of FBI uh, surveillance uh, through that time when the, uh, when, when the FBI ran a secret surveillance uh, um, program of Chinese American scientists. 
uh, suspecting uh, suspecting their lo uh, loyalty, questioning their loyalty, and suspecting that they were providing um, technology secretly to uh, to to their to their uh, ancestral homeland, and, um, and also uh, through this time in the 19, uh, 1970s, and this is of course happening under a very tense political uh, period in China through the Cultural Revolution and all these political campaigns. On the other hand, of course, the two countries had not established formal diplomatic relationships, but there were death dozens of Chinese scientists delegations, uh, totaling several hundred people, that visited the U.S. Uh, through the 1970s, including in 1975. There's uh, this meeting um, with uh, with uh, President Ford and uh, this uh, gentleman is uh, Zhou Peiyuan, um, who, um, who who led the delegation and was an, um, he was educated at Tsinghua University in China as well as University of Chicago and Caltech in the U.S. before returning to China uh, during the nationalist government and and was later one of the major figures in on the Chinese side in promoting scientific exchange between uh, between the two countries and also internationally. And, and, and also the Chinese American scientists uh, in the US um, as the broader Chinese American community also did a, a, a fair number of political organizing, including advocating for the normalization of relations uh, between the two countries. And um, after, <laughs> so now we come to 1979 with the normalization of relations. And on January 31st of 1979, uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, Deng Xiaoping signed um, the very first agreement between the two governments they signed uh, was this agreement on cooperation in science and technology. And, and this agreement was uh, first signed for a five-year term, but has been renewed uh, relatively regularly since then. And um, it was, um, it, it, it momentarily lapsed on uh, after 1989, after the uh, after the Tiananmen crackdown, and, and it was renewed then in 1991, but with an added clause on internet uh, on intellectual property protections, and then it had a. Um, had a bit of a, a, a stumble through uh, the Trump administration that was renewed for six months and four months in, in, in 2017 to 2018. And then it was renewed again for a five year term at the end of 2018. Um, so it remains in effect today, but with an additional um, uh, terms on intellectual property protection and, and trade secrets protection and added. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this, um, um, but, but th this agreement was on um, was it, it remains extremely important, but at the time also spun off dozens of interagency agreements and protocols in terms of cooperation between the two countries that just established um, diplomatic relations. And also at the, at the time, for the first time in decades, Chinese students could finally go to the US for further study. And, and it was a time, of course, China was emerging out of decades of political turmoil and utter devastation. So there were um, um, were relatively uh, limited educational resources, like the transcripts were, were limited, and the standardized tests like the, the TOEFL and the GRE were not available in China. And so um, again, Chinese American scientists in the US played an important role in, in building some of these bridges and these pathways for Chinese scientists scientists and students to come study and work in the US. Uh, one of the most prominent is uh, CASPIA, which is the China-US Physics an Examination and Application Program that was founded um, by, by Li Zhendao T.D. Li, who was uh, Yang, uh, Chen Yang's co-laureate um, in, in, in 1956 um, as um, as the two first uh, two Chinese uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates in physics. And at the time, uh, T.D. Li was a professor at Columbia University. And so he founded uh, this program that uh, through the 10 years of, of running, provide uh, uh, almost a thousand Chinese physicists to come study um, in the US. And there was a little uh, Caspia comm um, commemoration event in the 90s when uh, some of these uh, transcripts and standardized tests became available in China. So the program itself um, had, had fulfilled its purpose, um, but many of these uh, students then, um, if they stayed in the US, played important roles in, in science and education and in business in the US. And, and some of them returned, uh, returned to China and, and were also leaders in their professions. And in 1993, um, uh, T.D. Lee drew this um, drawing showing how this, uh, the meaning of this program and the inscription in Chinese here reads, uh, thousands of branches look separate, but they are connected at the roots. Uh, the entire forest started from one tree. And uh, starting from the time in 1978, when Deng Xiaoping said we should start sending Chinese students to the U.S. to study, and then he was um, 
he was making this suggestion not out of um, <laughs> just not be saying like not not saying like just um, we wouldn't have <laughs> control over people's movements. Uh, it was not from that uh, that standpoint, but also from a very practical standpoint. And he said, uh, "This is the fastest way to um, lift our country uh, technologically and um, to to have an effect within five years. The way to do it is to send students, and we shouldn't just send eight or ten; we should send tens of uh, thousands." But very quickly, the Chinese government needs to contend with human nature that uh, that that for for Chinese scientists and students as as people, they preferred a uh, more research resources, a better um, work environment and also a higher standard of living. So for the many uh, for the few several decades afterwards, the majority of Chinese students um, who studied abroad uh, stayed abroad. And I think this uh, graphic is um, um, illuminating in this context. And I think um, the way to look at it uh, in this uh, in this discussion in terms of uh, Chinese scientists um, studying overseas, uh, we should look at it before the sharp uptime in the mid 2000s, when a lot of these figures are driven by, by, by undergraduate students or, or master's degrees. Um, but before that, like up until the early 2000s, thousands, um, the majority, I think the figure is about 80% of the Chinese students who study overseas are graduate students and um, about two thirds majored in science and engineering. And, 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 and we could see the, um, the difference, the, the blue line is the ones who went abroad, the orange line is the ones who stayed, um, who went back to China. So it's only a small fraction, about 20 to 30% who went back to China. And so, um, but the, the, the economic situation in China was, of course, rapidly changing. So uh, from the early to late, um, mid to late 2000s, the Chinese government, when, 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 when the uh, social economic conditions in China has improved, the Chinese government has held this long hope that uh, a lot of these overseas trained Chinese scientists could return to China, um, but had very few things to offer. But now there, there are things to offer. So the Chinese government started to uh, launch these series of overseas talent recruitment programs. The most well known, of course, is Thousand Talent that is launched by the central government. But there are also um, really like a, a, probably up to uh, schools to hundreds of these different types of programs some of some of them um, supported by, by local city or provincial governments and including the, the Shenzhen um, the city of Shenzhen's uh, peacock plan and that notably one of its participants was uh, the biologist uh, He Jiankui who uh, did this extremely controversial and highly unethical um, first gene edited uh, babies experiment and he was recruited back to China through the peacock plan and um, these um, the, these talent recruitment programs um, promise generous research funding salary as well as a lot of personal benefits that were um, very meaningful in the Chinese context like housing and also who called the residential um, uh, registration. Uh, um, but and a lot of these programs are not exclusive to people of Chinese descent. There are also, of course, uh, non-Chinese participants in Thousand Talent. Um, but uh, they, they frequently appeal the sentiments of national belonging in their promotional materials. Um, for example, we have this um, uh, the screenshot that I took a couple of years ago from the homepage of Thousand Talent that uh, like the main content is in English, um, but the, the banners are in Chinese. I read the, the, the motherland needs you, the motherland welcomes you, the motherland places her hope in you. And this website, because I took the screenshot to, about two years ago, because it's no longer accessible. As we know, Thousand Talent has become one of the most contentious issues in bilateral relations or in geopolitics in general. And 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 uh, starting about sometime mid last year, this website is no longer accessible, and the word "qianrenjihua" in Chinese has largely been scrapped from the Chinese uh, Chinese search engines and forbidden in official documents because of its geopolitical sensitivity. So, what is the problem with these talent recruitment programs? Um, first, I should say that there are cases of ethical violations in these programs. Um, a lot of these are, ac um, are violations of academic um, academic uh, ethics where uh, scientists um, who participated in, in these programs as the Chinese government initially uh, designed were hoping that they would be able to to hire them for coming back to China full time, but relatively few uh, in the beginning were willing to. And so there were uh, these part time contracts contracts uh, that that were designed and 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 a, a fair number of of of, um, of overseas uh scientists uh, i say majority of them probably of chinese ethnicity um, um took on these um, part-time contracts and, and may uh 
may not may, may not have fulfilled the time requirements in these may not have properly disclosed these part-time contracts in, in, in with Chinese institutions in their uh, in their grant proposals to US funding agencies and and sometimes so so this is there are issues with transparency and non-disclosure there are also issues with with uh, ethical violations including some of the confidentiality in the course of peer review were um were violated. There were some uh, some some academic shortcuts, and, and that, that were prob um, probably probably made. And and some uh, lab, labs may feel like the U.S. labs may feel their work was being scooped by by their Chinese counterparts because of this uh, murky uh, collaborative relationship. And these are are are, are serious cases of uh, violations of academic ethics, but they were driven by by personal um, negligence, uh, misunderstandings of disclosure um, pro protocols, or just personal uh, personal greed and and um and, and, and personal mistakes. And, and what is problematic is now they are being passed into a geopolitical context. And 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 it um, it and so so the problem are no longer academic discipline or, or even ethical violations, which I myself think is the more important aspect that needs to be thought through that these um, international collaborations in science, what are the social, political, and moral implications of these? For example, like He Jianhui's extremely unethical gene edited um, babies experiment, where he did also have informal advisors in the US and that were looped in, in this process. And however, in this uh, in the current geopolitical context, especially this course here in the US, these talent programs were mainly seen as this conduit for an intellectual property theft, uh, which brings us to <laughs> uh, the very present context that uh, we know that in 2018, the, um, the, the Department of Justice under the Trump administration with Attorney General Sessions announced this China initiative. And uh, that its focus is to combat Chinese economic espionage, and there is a main focus is on academia. And 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 I should say that um, there is a lot of attention that is being paid on um, to on uh, this being um, a, a Trump administration in, a, initiative. However, uh, the scrutiny on on Chinese scientists in terms of suspicions of their uh, questions of their loyalty and suspicions of improper um, tech, uh, technological transfer really um, dates way back. That is started in the 1950s, as mentioned earlier. Um, when Chinese scientists of Chinese origin were even barred from leaving the country, and most notably the missile scientist Chen Xuesen, it flared up again in the 1990s, um, very notably with, with the case of, of Wen Ho Li at, at, at Los Alamos, as well as with the Cox report, uh, with congressman, uh, a, a congressional report alleging uh, Chinese uh, intellectual uh, espionage of, of uh, weapons technology. And then it has intensified in, in more recent years, and that really um, has started on, under the o Obama administration already. And so this is a new report from the Committee of 100 that did some of this empirical um, a statistical analysis and I should um, emphasize that this, these are cases that are prosecuted under the Economic Espionage Act. And we could see that um, this, um, the, in, in under, starting from the Obama administration, that the majority of the, um, of the defendants are of, um, of Chinese ethnicity, noted in blue um, here. And, uh, and also, um, what is also more meaningful, I, I think, is the Chinese uh, people of Chinese descent are more likely to be charged and also more likely to have their cases publicized by the Department of Justice. And then they are more likely to be innocent of more serious, um, more serious uh, offenses. They were charged on the Economic Espionage Act, um, but up to about um, a, qu uh, a quarter were, um, were, were only convicted of um, procedural offenses and all were actually uh, innocent. Uh, and, and um, and then also they are more likely to re receive harsher uh, treatments before trial and also receive longer uh, sentences. So there are uh, some some rather uh, alarming evidence with regards to uh, this uh, ra uh, ra ra racially um, based on um, discriminatory treatment and in the process of, of application of the Economic Espionage Act over the past two decades. Um, however, I should also mention that a lot of the cases under the China Initiative were not prosecuted 
prosecuted under the Economic Espionage Act, as mentioned, a lot of these cases were um, there were no uh, allegations of improper transfer of intellectual property, but they were um, prosecuted under um, improper disclosure of uh, in, in, um, in disclosure and so um, of, of uh, grant agencies were like wire fraud, tax fraud, or visa um, fraud, and and so with that. Um, We'll come to um, a, a, a brief discussion of how these um, how these ideas came about in the first in the first place. When we think about um, a university. Um, research being done at a university campus or, or an, a research focused laboratory. Um, what is being how could something be stolen something has to be owned in the first place to be stolen so so i think a lot of these discussions when on um, in the public discourse is focused um, on on uh, chinese uh, uh Ch chinese state affiliated uh, individuals uh, stealing knowledge without uh, enough questions being asked about what is the what is the concept of this ownership in the first place and so first of all uh, the question is um whether or not this information is classified and so i think a lot of these narratives of espionage immediately in the public imagination was something um, security related and uh, it, with regards like dual use technology or explicitly weapons technology or just classified research but this is actually a, a, a very very few of these uh, cases are, are actually involved classified information and this goes back to the national security decision directive on um, under the reagan administration when it was first issued um, with consideration of concerns over um, technology transfer to the Soviet Union. And then uh, the, the directive, which remains in effect today, is that um, the, the products of fundamental research remain unrestricted. And, uh, and, and when national security requires control, uh, the means to do it is classification. And here for this directive, fundamental research is actually defined more broadly that includes um, both uh, basic research as well as applied research, as long as it's not proprietary research or industrial um, development. And of course, also classified research itself is, is has always been highly controversial on university campuses uh, for reasons of ethics and academic freedom. However, um, it, it also uh, can, can appeal to sentiments of, of national service, and it can also bring substantial government funding to, um, uh, to, to university campuses, and it has seen a um, and there has been more uh, classified research being done uh, at U.S. universities, uh, some of them being done on campus, a lot of them on off, uh, at off-campus facilities, on, especially after 9-11, when there is a new hybrid uh, security climate. And so this is about classified information. But on um, a lot of these discussions that are with regards to um, the China initiative or a lot of these um, uh, heightened rhetoric are really not about classified information at all. They are about trade secret theft, uh, economic espionage. And so the question here is how could um, a, a research being done at a university even um, touch on, the, uh, on this aspect? And this also dates back to the, to the 80s. And with, with the passage of the Baidu Act in 1980, um, that allowed and actually encouraged universities to patent federal products from federally funded research and license them for profit. Of course, this was not done within the, uh, with, with Chinese, <laughs> with geopolitical competition with China in mind, but the idea was um, um, but but this is partly of a broader trend of the commercialization and privatization of, of higher education and of research, and 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 and, and in this and, and in this uh, this was happening analogous to increased um, criminalization of IP infringement, which traditionally has been treated as a civil dispute that uh, companies or whatever individuals can sue each other and for for damages. Um, but uh, since the, the the Economic Espionage Act, as we mentioned earlier in the previous slide in the, on the a committee of 100 report, right? The Economic Espionage Act is also a relatively recent thing that it only passed in 1996, signed by Bill Clinton. It was the first time that it made trade secret theft a federal crime. And so increasingly, it was the federal government's resources uh, that, uh, that, that one can fairly argue may be doing a lot of these private uh, conglomerates and private uh, companies fitting in, uh, in finding these um, these uh, spies or, or uh, st stolen alleged uh, stealing of technology. And also very importantly, the idea of intellectual property protection um, has become uh, transnationalized um, under the w um, WTO with, with the TRIPS um, uh, agreement. And 
and and and and there are a lot of cr critiques on it as well, which is like in quote unquote imposing U.S. style intellectual property protection on 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 on, on all other countries, regardless of its social or legal um, tradition or its stage of economic development. So here there is an important context, which is. Um, the United States, when it itself was a developing country, uh, when, when it was newly gained independence from Great Britain, and also violated a lot of export control laws and immigration laws from, uh, from, from, from Great Britain and from Europe and to acquire advanced technology and acquire highly trained technical talent for its own um, and for, uh, economic and technological development. And, and and up until like even the 20th century in Vannevar Bush's report um, and the endless frontier, he actually noted that our country can no longer rely on Europe for fundamental science because the continent or uh, the European continent was devastated by war. So we need to invest in ourselves. And so in that, uh, in, in that sense, it is, um, uh, it is important to place this into a into a historical and a global context that in the present day it is true that uh, the Chinese government and all the Chinese entities with or without and a lot of cases uh, without direct uh, direct directives from the Chinese government and have violated a lot of these um, um intellectual uh, property uh, regulations or um, or even conducted trade secret theft but the Chinese government China, China quote, uh, has been cheating, but the game was rigged in favor of the United States. And in the current context, when we discuss, for example, uh, with the COVID uh, vaccines, and, and and there should be a broader uh, reckoning with regards to what whom do the intellectual property regimes actually protect, and are these the best ways to uh, for the well-being of, of people, of the public, as well as for the advancement of science, or is it actually protecting the interests of, um, of the very privileged, the wealthiest, most powerful few? And with that, I'll come to my closing slide, uh, which we come back to uh, to the contact concept of the endless frontier. And uh, that this uh, this January, uh, right before the inauguration, President Elect Biden um, sent his um, science advisor Eric Lander uh, five questions, uh, one more than, uh, than than Roosevelt. And I should also note here that Eric Lando is the founder of the Broad Institute, and the Broad Institute co-managed uh, by, by Harvard and MIT, and of course was embroiled in this multi-year bitter um, intellectual property fight with University of California Berkeley over rights to CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. So I think there is a there is a broader conversation that is uh, re not not in the national rivalry sense, but just how intellectual property uh, rules on, on university campuses um, may, may create kinds of cultures that are uh, uh, that are harmful to academic freedom and and, and to equity um, and uh, equitable development in science. But with that, to Biden's questions. So he asked Eric Lander five questions, starting with pandemic and climate change. And the last two questions about equi uh, equitable sharing of knowledge in, in science and the long-term health of science in this country. But the third question was about how do we ensure global uh, United United States can remain the global leader in science and technology, especially in competition with China. And then um, in this, uh, in this uh, some early summer, the Senate passed uh, the Endless Frontier Act, which is, has been since been renamed to the US Innovation and Competition Act. Um, but it, uh, as Chuck Schumer said, it is um, a once in a generation investment in American science and American technology. And most notably, it gives a, a significant increase in funding to um, to the NSF, um, and as well as um, establishing a new directorate um, for, for technology and innovation at NSF, and, and also appropriates um, more funding to uh, to the DOE and DOD um, for, for science and technology. But so government investment in science and technology is it's great. Um, but but the problem here is how it is being framed, and 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 this uh, this bill is very much framed in in a in a national uh, in a techno nationalist sense that these funding are are used to um to to advance uh, uh national interests of the United States to win this geopolitical great power competition against uh, China to curb Chinese state influence and ambitions, and there are also these added terms to to the act about um a boycotting Beijing Olympics, searching for COVID origins and. And, um, 
and all, all the sanctioning Chinese officials and this and that. And so here uh, I will take a couple of minutes to say very quickly um, what what actually concerns me and, and alarms me with with this with this current rhetoric. And so um, the American Physi uh, Physical Society APS just conducted a survey of over 3000 um, physicists in the, in the US and um, uh, about uh, uh, nearly 20% uh, one in five on um, have um, stated that they have uh, chosen to uh, chosen to or directed to uh, stop uh, some some form of international collaboration in their research um, because of the current scrutiny of, of research security concerns and about 40 percent of international uh, physicists in the US have stated that they found the research environment in, uh, uh, to be hostile to uh, because of the recent geopolitical tensions. Um, but I think probably more importantly, in addition to this research climate, is what kind of research is actually being done. Uh, so one thing that uh, uh, Marco Rubio tried to uh, put into the Endless Frontier Act, which he finally, uh, in the end, voted against, but this is an important point, is about uh, uh, sanction, uh, sanctioning uh, Chinese uh, tech firms that uh, participate in Chinese, uh, say, st uh, state oppression, such as like the uh, surveillance, or especially ethnic uh, crackdown on, on the Uyghur population. And, and of course, the, uh, the, the US government, the Commerce Department and, and state have placed these rest various restrictions with regards to uh, not, not selling components to some of these companies or not purchasing equipment from these companies, uh, these Chinese companies that are implicated in state, state surveillance and oppression. And I believe this is a, a right thing to do, but this is uh, simply a ban by national borders is not enough. The, mo the more important both be on a practical sense because of the supply chains are, are so uh, so intricately uh, connected and and, and uh, the, the existing regulations also have a lot of loopholes but more importantly from an ethical and moral standpoint these the more important question to ask is why were these technologies created in the first place and they of course started in academia and and a lot of these um the the, uh, the scientists who are involved in these uh, in creating the, these technologies, regardless of what country they are from, what country they work in, um, their research were, were discussed in international forums, published in peer-reviewed journals. And so the more important question um, it is, is indeed that to, to evaluate the social, uh, social consequences of, of this work, that a lot of these harms were not created by accident, they were by design. And when science is being framed in the in the context of national rivalry, and um, we can see here like a lot of tech tech firms in the U.S. Um, have been using this narrative to win a competition with China to lobby against regulations and to lobby for um, types of research, for example, a uh, uh, militarized uh, use of, of artificial intelligence, etc. And 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 really, if we look at the communications from both governments in terms of these um, emerging technologies, they sound alarmingly similar. And and I. Think I think that that is, that is uh, the greater the greater worry, uh, that it, uh, that if we actually look at the most pressing um, issues facing humanity, facing us as a species, then they are really not uh, they cannot be contained by any national borders. And inherent risks from new technologies are not a derivative of and cannot be masked by simply a, a nature of a political system, let alone by by the um, by by the name. Or, or, or the uh, or the concept of national allegiance and affiliation, and so that's it. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Chung, for that really, really interesting presentation. Um, before our discussion, I just want to remind the audience if they want to ask questions to please submit them in the Q&A and, &A, and um, we will uh, do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so this is really fascinating. I love how you sort of went over the history of US-China exchange in science um, and as well as sort of these recent tensions that we've been seeing. Um, so one of the things that I find to be really interesting is, um, you know, so much of the tension over science has been about national security, it's been about IP, it's been about these sort of, where you could think about these issues in, you know, very specific fields, and even within a field, very specific subfield of that field, right? Yet these, you know, recent investigations or scientists who have been affected by these recent investigations is 
their fields are actually quite broad, right? Because the investigations have been focused around disclosures rather than necessarily national security and IP, right? Um, and some of these, as you said, were you know real negligence, real violations in transparency. Others may be more misunderstandings or um, you know about what needed to be disclosed. Um, but what's interesting is that then the people affected are not just um, in these national security areas, but also in sort of basic science, trying to solve disease, trying to sort of do, you know, make innovations that are not, um, you know, part of this national, or maybe, you know, not at the core part of this national rivalry. So, so how do you see this impacting science broadly? And what areas do you think will be most affected um, by um, these recent tensions and investigations? Mm -hmm. This this is a, re a really great question, and and I'll answer it and actually slightly um, broader because I actually think like as as you as you uh, as you as you mentioned first of all a lot of these um these cases are are not about intellectual property theft and and there are also two layers to this right from a legal standpoint it may be that there were suspected intellectual property theft but it's hard to prove it in a criminal case so they were choosing uh, a prosecution were choosing non disclosure on, on on a tax form or on a grant proposal as as the legal strategy um but on on the on, on the other uh, so that i think the knowledge should have but on the other hand uh, the more important part is probably that ac academia needs to have the ability to self to self regulate and self discipline and we have um we as in academia have have had um these regulations in place at disclosure and, and in terms of transparency and understanding conflicts of interest are very important. But this is a responsibility for academia when they are being criminalized in this way um, and being cast into a national security lens. This is harmful for, um, for, 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 for academia, for academia in, in general. And, and also like, for example, uh, the NSF, the inspector general at NSF has mentioned how uh, over the past few years, the cases directed by the FBI to their office has increased a thousandfold, and now 63% of all the cases they handle are with regards to this kind of international collaboration on disclosure. And that is, and, and they are strapped for resources. And there are also other issues <laughs> that the NSF Inspector General's office and just like academia in general needs to pay attention to that that are extremely uh, important. And, and so when attention is being paid on these issues, that should, first of all, a lot of these shouldn't be criminalized in the first place. Not that saying it's not wrong, but but not everything wrong needs to be a crime. And and secondly, what is being missing when so much attention is being paid on who um, ticked what box or, or said whether they they um, uh, whether they have these collaborations very specifically with the Chinese government. And then thirdly, there is also motivations for U.S. law enforcement. And this is why, like a lot of these attentions are being paid on on, on research that are on. Um, um, Broad, broadly speaking, have, have no uh, uh, applicable value, like some mathematicians are being in, in involved as well, or if they were, um, uh, or, or they have no dual use implications, like some of the medical research, and they're, they're beneficial in general. Um, but from a law enforcement standpoint, the FBI or the district att uh, US attorney's office, because they are incentivized by this initiative and, and uh, would, would start looking for these cases. So that also has a negative impact on the overall law enforcement culture uh, in the US and has a, a broader negative impact as well. And sorry, this is a really long winded answer. But the, f the last thing that I wanted to say is, um, related with what is being missing when so much attention is being paid on on who may not who may may or may not have some form of collaboration with chinese entities is uh, so much is being placed on this superficial fact uh, without more attention being paid into what kind of work is actually being done because the most important question is not who is doing the work or where the work is being done but how the work is being done and what it is being used for and whether or not there is actual harm for example there are instances for example um, here at, at Yale there was a former um, a retired geneticist who was working on these uh, uh, gene 
uh, genetic data bank that uh, with with Chinese state security that uh, would most certainly has involved on uh, uh, genetic information from uh, from the Uyghur population that were uh, forcibly collected. And there was also an, a computer scientist at Michigan State that was involved in designing some of these uh, facial recognition um, uh, tools uh, for for Chinese state security. And these are very serious ethical concerns. And I feel that more attention should be paid on these types of collaborations instead of this narrow narrow focus on the nationalistic framework. Thanks. That was a really a really thorough answer. Um. So just in the interest of time, I mean, I have I have lots of questions. <laughs> talk later. Um, uh, the, I'm going to sort of turn, we have a, you know, a really nice set of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to turn um, uh, to um, these questions. Um, so what of them, um, um, here, let's see. Um, so one of them is why do programs like the Thousands Talents program tend to focus on overseas Chinese? Why not outright hire overseas talent, regardless of ethnicity, to work in Chinese universities? Um, this is how the U.S. took a lot of talent from Europe. Yeah. Um... I, I think I, I think this is this is a really really great question, and it was partly also I, I find it interesting because that was what first drew me uh, uh, drew me to the, to the website as well. It's just like oh, it's not even subtle. Um, but but I think it is uh, there are multi layers. The first is I, I think um, it speaks to it is um, it is a smart strategy uh, because even now like I have colleagues who are from like um, like Greece or Sri Lanka and countries where they th their parents are first generation immigrants scientists coming to this country and now they're approaching retirement age their children are grown and they may want to go go back to their uh, to, to their birth countries just just out of a, a pure personal sentiment and 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 so so this is completely unrelated not related with China not related with with geopolitics but so I think this this personal sentiment the Chinese government recognizes it and, and feel that it can be exploited uh, to to its uh, to its benefit so so there is this practical element the second is there is an ideological element to this as well that the Chinese government does uh, seek to see itself as not just um controlling a territory but really representing a people and it has this uh th this complicated on 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 reach uh, beyond its borders to the entire Chinese diaspora. And so I think there's a lot of these overseas talent recruitment programs, um, whether or not they were explicitly designed aligned with that technology uh, with that ideology are certainly influenced uh, influenced by it. And um, yeah, so and I think thirdly, uh, with regards to recruiting uh, directly from just uh, ethnic, ethnically blind recru recruiting, I think a, a, a part of it is also is also true that that the Chinese, um, um, the Chinese uh, uh, within China, like the, the social and, and cultural customs, including within academia, there are uh, there are a lot of these customs are are, are still uh, not not very well um, uh, regulated, uh, uh, like with a lot of these bureaucracies or lack of transparencies and it creates some uh, some issues for um, for for overseas uh, for for just um for for uh, foreign scientists who do not have a Chinese background. And so so there is a, a lack of appeal factor there as well and of course there is a linguistic barrier. Great. Um, so let's I'm trying to sort of um, merge some questions together to get at some of the sort of themes that um, that um, I'm getting from um, from the Q and A because we don't have enough time to get to everybody. Um, so one of the sort of themes of questions that I'm seeing is um, for what are sort of the costs of restricting international collaboration. Uh, in, Generally on science, um, and um, you know where how where might we see these costs um, appear um, in terms of scientific achievements or capabilities or the economy, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so I think I think that this is this is a great quest. This is a great question, but I think um, I, I always have reservations with on um, how this quest uh, how how this cost is generally being framed like um so I, I don't know whether this question itself was about cost to to the united to the united states as i mentioned right for example the, um, the aps the american physical society survey with regards to um the uh, uh one in five stopping international collaborations 40 percent of international scientists feeling the u.s is hostile and that would negatively impact their decision to stay in the u.s and i think these figures are all valid but this is all framed in a, in a nationalistic framing was 
with regards to science, uh, to the to the amount of science or to the number of scientists in the US. And, and there are, of course, this uh, god awful term called a brain drain, which I absolutely hate because like a person is not a brain and that is an absolutely ableist and elitist term and it's, uh, it's antithetical to, um, to, to, to the principle that migration should be a human right. Um, but I think these all, um, but, but these these phrases coming in the discourse is is still in, in the framing thinking that science is something the more is the more is better and and there is a certain sense of, of competition or even national leadership and I think these all miss the point the, the most important question is under this kind of nationalistic framing when science is being portrayed as a tool of national greatness and being used as a an asset in geopolitical competition what kind of science is actually being done and i think this is the this is the most serious long term long term long term risk that on a lot especially a lot of these fields that are like so called emerging technologies how they can be used and how they should be used are not predetermined but if right now like whether it's uh, quantum computing which is still very far on the horizon in terms of applications always is a, a, a <laughs> um uh, some of these are uh, this blanket term artificial intelligence but with regards to uh, 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 automated um, weaponry or or with some of these uh, surveillance systems um what needs to be done right now is to have these transnational frameworks of regulation to ensure the, eth and the, the eth ethics and safety of both development and application. But these conversations are a lot of times being drowned out by this nationalist frame, uh, framing and, 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 and scientists and companies and just entities in both countries being people and being uh, ambitious or greedy and cre with careerist considerations would also exploit their countries, uh, their, their government's framing uh, and to, to push forward on these kinds of, of technologies and, and applications, not necessarily for nefarious reasons, but just out of blindness as well. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's a really, um, I really get that sort of the focus, the, the kind of takeaway of, of your talk, right, which is like, let's think about the ethics of developing technology as, um, as, as underlying this. So um, just as a last question, um, two sort of related points. One is um, a question about, you know, there are certain um, technology areas like semi semiconductors, um, where um, the US has a really a real national interest in protecting these sort of critical technologies. Um, you know, how can the US attempt to, you know, navigate the geopolitical relationship of protecting this com commodity. And on the other side of that, there are a lot of questions about at the same time, how do um, civil society groups or the international community advocate for continuing scientific collaboration? So how do we do both of those things at once? Allow sort of you know, national interests to protect certain types of technology at the same time as encouraging scientific collaboration on maybe um, aspects of science that we think are, are um, you know, good for human values, et cetera. Yeah, thank you so much. And I should preface this by saying that I am very sorry that I <laughs> that I, um, I talked over time, and I'm happy to stay uh, stay over time online as well because I feel really bad for not being able to get to a lot of these questions. Um, but and so coming to to semi semiconductors as an as an example, and I think this is this is really interesting. And and coming to the framing of this question, right? Why on um, why does the United States have a national interest in in protecting this technology? I think that this that this basis uh, needs needs to be quite questions as well. And if we look at the history of semiconductor development, right, a lot of that, uh, um, part, part of it um, has a lot of historical and political reasons why uh, China as opposed to Taiwan um, did not um, was not able to develop a, a more cutting edge semiconductor technology, and a lot of that speaks to um, the, to to the political uh, con, uh, constraints and also mistakes on uh, of the, uh, of Chinese um, government as well as on academia. However. And um, uh, some of these constraints also uh, also re relates to an international uh, framework of, of intellectual property uh, uh, of property regimes that uh, that creates this kind of monopoly that there are only so many companies in the world that have this technology. And is that a good thing for the future of humanity? 
And and I think I think analogy one might make, make is with with for example the vaccine development. It is true that there are only uh, there are relatively few companies in the world that are capable of manufacturing these types of vaccines. But is that a good? Um, but what, how how did that come about? It comes from with with decades of of IP protection and the monopolies and and it's mo the more powerful companies in, in line with their governments that that have created this kind of this kind of um unhierarchical and and um, fundamentally unequitable environment and so so i think i think these are the questions that needs that needs to be asked that for technology that is so widely used like semiconductors what what happens to our uh to to our ethical and moral imagination when it is being cast as this um important a uh, chip uh, <laughs> And excuse my terrible pun here in, in the geopolitical contest. And, and of course, semiconductors are used in a variety of things, and it can be used for, for, for weaponry, for, for military modernization as well. But then the question is not about semiconductors, it's about how do we um, how do we direct our scientific and technological development away from uh, instrumentations of harm and, and to, uh, to, to a more safe and equitable future. Great. Well, we'll end with that comment. Um, I uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chung, for being with us and sharing this really interesting history and uh, you know perspective and research on um, uh, U.S. Uh, China tensions and science. Um, and um, so thank you uh, so much also to all of you in the audience for being us today, with us today. Uh, the webinar will be available in the next few days on our website, china.ucsd.edu. Um, you can also look at the screen right now, some of our upcoming events. Um, Jennifer Pan will uh, be presenting about um, counter narrative strategies of Chinese state media on Twitter on um, November 3rd. Uh, we have Rana Mitter from the University of Oxford uh, talking about um, memory of World War II shaping a new nationalism on November 10th. And we have John Yasuda from John Hopkins on December 2nd, talking about necessary fictions, the state stock markets and growth in East Asia. So we hope you join us for these future events and see you all next time.